Thank you. Please be seated. Dr. Samuels, please come forward and take a seat. Let's bring in the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Sir, what date did you administer the MCMI? Uh, it was early November of 2009. Uh, specifically, what, what, what date, though? Uh, I don't have the record. I can tell you when the test was scored, which would have been a day or two after it was administered. So roughly November 7th, uh, maybe November 12th, 13th, or 14th, in that ballpark of sure. 2009. The, uh, this, the results, the numerical results that you get with this uh, test, they're compared against the numerical results of psychiatric patients, correct? Yes. They're not compared against the general population, right? That's correct. But the inquiry in this case, what, what we're here to do is to determine or look at the defendant as she compares to the general population, not psychiatric patients, right? No, that's not true. That's not how I used it. So I know that's not how you used it, but what you're actually doing is you're looking at the defendant and comparing her to people who already have been diagnosed with something, correct? Well, yes, that's how the test is set up. Sure. Rather than comparing her to, for example, somebody in the general population so we can actually get an accurate picture of how she varies or does not vary from somebody in the general population, right? Um, I'm, I'm not sure of, of what you mean. Could you please clarify that for me and I'll be happy to answer. Sure. The test scores that you get are compared to the scores of people of psychiatric patients, correct? Correct. They are not compared to the test of somebody in the general population, That's true. right? Yes. So basically what you're doing is is you're comparing the scores of the defendant to somebody who's already sick for lack of a better term, right? For lack of a better term. Sure. And with regard to the inquiry that we have here, don't you agree that it would be much more valid to have her tests compared to somebody in the general population who doesn't have these issues so we can see if she deviates or she doesn't deviate. No, that's not how I use the test. I know that's not how you use the test, but that's not my question. My question is, don't you think that a more valid approach would have been to compare or conduct a test that compares her to the general population to see if she varies or if she doesn't vary? No, I don't think that would have been better. The test that you gave her, you said it was in November of what year? Um, 2009. And so if we take a look at Exhibit 534, this is the PDS. This is after that, right? It must be, yes. Well, is it or isn't it? Well, that's a different date, so it's after that, yes. So in other words, the MCMI was conducted before, correct? That's correct. And so if it's conducted before, this is still when the defendant is adhering to the view or telling people, you specifically, that um, two individuals came in and they're the individuals that were responsible for killing Mr. Alexander, correct? Correct. You did indicate that in the this particular test, the MCMI, that there is a, there are validity scales, right? Correct. Um, those validity scales, for whatever reason, even though she was talking about one story involving two people, now she changed her story to something else. This test that's supposed to pick out, um, not malingering, but faking, if you will, um, didn't pick it up here, right? No, the internal scales are designed to determine whether or not someone was honest in answering the items on the test. It is not at all linked to an external story or a one story or another. Whereas the PDS is, correct? Not really either. No. Well, sir, do we have to go through question 14 again, what she answered? It is linked to, to the answer at question 14, isn't it? Uh, you're referring to the PDS test? Yes. Well, yes, yes, but yes. 
whereas this other one is not, correct? Not at all, no. There is no reason to believe that if on January 15th of 2010 she is maintaining that there were these two individuals that killed Mr. Alexander and that's a traumatic event, there is no reason to believe that the answers that she is providing with a test that she took earlier have anything or are indicate, indicative of a change in story, are they? Overall. The uh, results of the MCMI do not reflect whether someone is telling one story or another. What it does reflect is the internal state of the individual. She experienced the trauma, even though she was telling a story that, uh, that was different from what actually happened. So this test reflects her internal struggle, her internal emotional state, and in my opinion, is perfectly valid. Even though it is compared against psychiatric patients and not the general population. Well, it was done deliberately. I understand it was done deliberately, but my question is, even though it, the scores are compared to those of psychiatric patients, correct? Yes. Sir, one of the things that uh, we talked about yesterday was this, uh, exhibit number 530. And this had to deal with memory, right? Correct. You gave it a name, right? What was the memory? Dissociative? Dissociative amnesia. Right. And one of the things that you told us, well, right here is when it starts to create a problem, right? There's Correct. The, the event, whatever the event may be. Correct. And then when you get to this point, you're not going to be able to remember throughout this whole U area, correct? That's correct. So you said that it starts right here well, and it and ends I, right there. This is just a pencil drawing. I, I don't know precisely when it occurred with Ms. Arias, but this is the general form of the development of a dissociative amnesia based upon and, stress. And, and you told us... You came in here and you talked about all about dissociative amnesia, and that's all I'm talking to you about, right? right? Yes. With regard to this dissociative amnesia, it starts here, and it ends up here, correct? Correct. And so this fogginess or whatever would start right around here, or would it be down here? More likely somewhere along the downward slope. Right up there and no, at the end? somewhere along the slope. I can't pinpoint it. And you also told us that when along this continu U continuum, that if an individual because the hippocampus is affected, and you explained all of that, that the person cannot form memory, correct? During that period of time, right. that is true. From here to here, it's your opinion that a person doesn't form memory, right? Approximately, correct. You, okay, now you're saying approximately. What does that mean, approximately? Is well, it you're yes? pointing to a particular area on the curve. This was a pencil drawing. There's no way to know for sure, but somewhere along the downward slope, the impact on the hippocampus is such that no new memories are being formed. All right, but it's the downward slope, right? Somewhere on the downward slope. And then when we get up here, that's when the memory comes back. It begins right? to the, the ability of the memory, the hippocampus to store memories, begins to increase as time progresses. And it on the upward angle, if you will, when the memory starts to come back, that's right? right. You also, the first day that you testified, you had some, uh, some slides about some police officer, and you indicated that that was uh, from, uh, what, what magazine was it? Time magazine. Some, from Time magazine, right? And you talked about how was, that was an example of this issue involving the dissociative memory, right? No, that was an example of someone, exper a trained officer experiencing an acute stress reaction. There was no mention as to whether right. or not he suffered from amnesia in that article. All right. Let's assume, let's take that police officer and let's assume that he does suffer from amnesia. All right? Okay. And his amnesia, according to you, if it's of the dissociative type, would start here, around here, right, and end around there, right? That's typically what we see. Right. And that's what you were telling us, right? Correct. So let's assume that this police officer is involved in a confrontation. And he's down here in this portion of the curve. All right? Correct. And if he's down here, let's assume that he is attacked by a knife. Okay. Okay. And some period of time goes by. He goes to this position right here. And then he is attacked or shot with a handgun. Let's assume that, right? Could you repeat what you just said? When he gets down here at the very bottom, yeah. he's attacked or shot at with a handgun. Okay. All right? He's not going to have, if we're talking about dissociative memory, any memory of that, right? 
if he was the, per, the one, the individuals who were, uh, were likely to suffer from uh, dissociative amnesia, that would be true. Okay, let's assume he's suffering from dissociative amnesia. That would be true, what I just right. posited, right? Right. So, for example, when he is shot down here, or, or attacked, or whatever happens with the gun down here, according to you, the hippocamp hippocampus is at such a state that he cannot form any memory, right? Typically, yes. And so if he can't form any memory there, and he can't form memory, any memory here, if this officer then moves up to this area here, he has no memory, for example, of the gun, does he? If he, if he had entered into a state of dissociative amnesia, the answer would be yes. Well, we assume that. You, you were telling us about true dissociative amnesia when you testified, Okay, right? fine. We're going with what you testified. Okay. So, if he is in this true dissociative amnesia state, at this point here, he will not remember the gun that was there, right? Correct. So that if, for example, he goes over to the suspect, he's a police officer, he goes over to the suspect, he won't know where the gun is, right? Um, he would not have the conscious ability to go over to the suspect if he was in a true state of acute stress. All right, but you're saying he couldn't even walk over, he could... The fact that you have this lack of memory doesn't mean you fall down, right? Oh, no, no. Not he, he can ambulate, right? He, he could ambulate, Sure. Yes. So if he ambulates over to the suspect, he's not going to know where the gun is because he has no memory of it, right? That's possible. No, not that's possible. Isn't that what you told us yesterday? If it's true dissociative amnesia, that he wouldn't? He wouldn't have, okay, if it was true dissociative uh, sure. amnesia, he would not have a memory of where the gun was. Right, and that's what you were telling us yesterday. Yes. And the same is true for the knife. If, for example, he, we know that he can ambulate, if he starts going, this is the gun and this is the knife, mm -hmm. if he then continues to ambulate and there's a knife involved, he will not know where that knife is because he cannot form any uh, memory at that point, right? In true dissociative amnesia. Unless... Objection, Yara, as to clarification, because we're hearing about knife, gun, what, what time, what foundation is, is the state talking about when... This a person, hypothetical person, is supposed to not know when things are. All right. Uh, it's very confusing. So your objections, foundation? Foundation and clarification, so that we all know that we're talking about the same thing. On the continuum, sir. We're talking only about the continuum. Mm -hmm. No other place, uh, you know, and we're true dissociative amnesia, which is what you discussed before, yes. right? And we previously talked that right here, there would be the, the knife, okay. down here would be the gun, okay. all right? Yes. If we then get to this position here, which is a little bit going up, if it's true dissociative amnesia, he can ambulate, walk over to where the suspect was, but he wouldn't know where the gun was, correct? That's possible, yes. You keep saying that's possible, and yet you tell me in true dissociative amnesia, he would not know. Which, which one is it? If it was true dissociative yes. amnesia, he would, be un, he would be less likely to remember the position of things that were dropped. That's so true. what you're not telling me is that even when you have true dissociative amnesia, you can remember things, right? No, I'm not saying that. In a case of... Well, then, hold on. How would he then be able to know where the gun was if he had amnesia? Objection. Yes, he was trying to answer the question, and, and the prosecutor specifically stopped him. I think he finished his answer overruled. Can you right. repeat? I'm sorry. Ma'am, could you read the question back to me? How would he be able to know where the gun was if he had amnesia? Okay, if he had true dissociative amnesia, he would be unlikely to know where the gun was. You keep saying unlikely, and that leaves the possibility that even if an individual has amnesia, he would know where things are, right? Well, when we do work like this, we always talk in probabilistic terms. The probability may be 100%, but it could be 90%. And so it's hard to know retrospectively exactly what degree of dissociative amnesia an individual had. So what I'm trying to be is more accurate, actually, by giving the answer that I am. Yeah, I know you're trying to be more accurate, but we're talking about true dissociative amnesia here, aren't we? True dissociative amnesia here, aren't we? Okay. I mean, you keep getting off of that done. It is true dissociative... ...characterization that he's avoiding the question. Distinct. We're talking about true dissociative amnesia. Do you understand that? Yes. So when you say that it is unlikely, 
that leaves the possibility that even though a person has amnesia, pursuant the way you're display, this, uh, uh, discussing this, he can still remember. So which one is it? A person with true dissociative amnesia is very unlikely to remember anything at the acute phase of the, of the incident. So what you're saying is that even though, a, what is amnesia? Amnesia is a loss, usually permanent, of a time frame of memories. So if we have this true amnesia, if you will, how are you able to then say, well, it could be likely that he would remember, then it wouldn't be amnesia. Referring things in terms of probability and likely is more correct scientifically, especially in the field of psychology. However, I can say that if a person was in a true state of dissociative amnesia, at least during the most intense portion of that time frame, it's highly unlikely that someone would remember anything going on at that right. time. And so, as in my example, he wouldn't be able to remember the gun, even right. if he could ambulate, right? Right. He couldn't remember the knife if he were... If ambulate. it was at that point, yes. And, for example, if this individual here, this officer, had been on surveillance and had been taking photographs, and during this melee, whatever it was, camera went flying somewhere. He would not have any memory of that camera either if it happened during this phase down here. That's right? highly possible, yes. But under true dissociative amnesia, right? Right. You talked about something called transglobal amnesia. Do you remember the first time? Yes, transient global amnesia. I'm sorry, transient global amnesia. And you indicated uh, yesterday that that didn't apply here, right? It doesn't apply here, correct. Right. So then why were we talking about it initially? Was there a reason why we were talking well, about it? Well, as I indicated the other day, um, I believe that question was asked, um, that I use it as an example to show that the occurrence of amnesia in society is not that all uncommon, and that it can occur for relatively minor stressful occurrences. But in, in your, this is the one that talked about sexual intercourse, right? As according to the review articles of 119 articles, one of the, one of the or maybe more than one, as I said, there were 119 articles that were reviewed, indicated that sexual intercourse was at least one of the factors that appeared to produce transient global amnesia. And so that's a yes, right? Yes. And also hot water. Dipping. Hot immersion in hot right. water or cold water. Uh, again, we're talking about things that don't have anything to do with this particular case, do we? That's that. correct. And so you're the one that put that slide up there, though, right? That's correct. And even though it had nothing to do with this particular case, right? Correct. Uh, one of the other things that we talked about was that you said, well, the defendant um, never said anything negative about Mr. Alexander in her journals. Do you remember saying that? In her, yes, I do. Yes. And let's talk about exhibit number 510. It says here, if Travis found out, he'd get upset, but I will not stand for him saying anything negative about her. In fact, from now on, I will not stand for him saying anything negative of any of my friends. Right? Yes. And that was back on August of 2007, right? Yes. You were saying that this was an individual that was not very assertive. No, she was not very assertive. Right. You saw her in, what, 2009 and 2010 is when you began to see her, right? Correct. You're saying that that individual that you saw in 2009 and 2010, even though she wrote that back in 2007, was not very assertive. She was not very assertive, no. So the fact that she said, I will not stand for him saying anything negative about any of my friends, that doesn't mean that she's assertive. No, it does not. So in spite of the fact that the language indicates otherwise, you're going to take issue with that, uh, even though it does indicate otherwise. You were indicating, are you saying, are you referring to this as an example of her saying something negative about Mr. Alexander, or an example of her being assertive, at least in writing? I thought we were talking about being assertive. Do you have a problem with remembering what no, I just said? No, I don't have any more problem than you do, sir. Well, sir, I asked you about her being assertive. Do you remember yes. me asking you? And asking you about her being assertive in 2009 and 2010 when you met her, right? Yes. And you were answering my questions and had no concern about it at that point, Correct. right? And so then when I posed this to you, this exhibit number 510, all of a sudden you're saying that you don't understand. 
I didn't say I didn't understand. Well, my question to you is, even though this is written down, you're saying don't believe what's written down because you're saying she wasn't assertive even though this indicates that she is assertive. Assert question and mischaracterizing his testimony. Jimmy answered. Assertiveness is a characteristic of behavior. And one of the primary characteristics is being to say something and act something out and hold your ground and say what's on your mind in a non-aggressive manner, but rather to get your point across. The mere fact that she wrote down she's not going to stand for it anymore is nothing more than her writings. It is not an example of behavioral assertiveness. But you're speculating that she didn't say it to him, aren't you? I read it in her journal. No, you're speculating that she never told this to Mr. Alexander. I don't know that she told it to right. him. Right, and so you're speculating that she didn't. Right. I'm so you don't know if she did or not then, right? In our verbal conversations, I got the impression after meeting with her a dozen times for between 25 and 30 hours that she was not at all assertive, especially back then. That's her telling you this, right? That's from reading her writings and her telling me right. and other evidence that I happen to evaluate. And this is the individual that wasn't truthful on the PDS, right? Or, or discussed a version of events that she subsequently changed, right? Uh, uh, yes, I'll say yes to that. And it's, this is an individual that lied to the police, right? Correct. This is an individual that called Mr. Alexander after she killed him, right? Correct. So this is an individual that lied to her friends, right? Knowledge. I don't know. But hold on. Well, he just answered the question. He doesn't know. All right, I rule. Well, oh. sir, you were asked about a conversation that uh, the defendant had with Leslie Udy yesterday. Do you remember that? I do. Oh, you do remember it then, right? Objection argumentative. The state. And during this conversation, you were able to tell us that the defendant, although the statements were not true, you try to tell us why she had said them. Do you remember that? Yes, yes, I did. Right. So you have all of this range of knowledge as to the defendant's spoken words, yet you can look at an entry from back of 2007 and say, well, she wrote it, but she didn't do anything about it, right? It's not an example of assertiveness. The assertiveness is measured through her behavior, not through the writings. It's easy to write a strong statement. But based upon everything else that was told to me, she is not an assertive person, especially back in 2007. And the person who told you all of this is the defendant, right? Correct. You didn't talk to anybody, you didn't conduct any interviews, for example, with somebody named Daniel Freeman, right? No. You didn't talk to Leslie Udy, right? No. You didn't talk to her family, right? No. You didn't talk to anybody else, you just talked to the defendant, right? That is correct, I only spoke to the defendant. Right. And once you spoke with the defendant, and based on whatever other material you had, you made the assessment, if you will, that she was a person who was not assertive, correct? Correct. The other thing that you were asked about was exhibit number 511. And you were asked about it, and, and you remember the lower portion here? Yes. It says, uh, but there are certain things that will never sit right with me about. But we didn't read the other part. Him. Me and him, right? Mm -hmm. And then it says, for example, right? She clarifies what she's talking about, mm -hmm. right? Yes. He always makes that ridiculous joke, families can be forever why do you want to spend so much time with them now? That's what was making her upset, right? Yes, for, as an example, yes. Yeah, it's it's because he's saying things. And then she says, I abhor that. I want the family man. A man who takes family seriously. Right? Yes. That's what she writes. I know he jokes, but that drives me crazy and it's a big turn off, but he has told me time and again that if he could marry me, he, it would mean he won the wife lottery, right? Yes. That's sweet, actually. 
I want to have a companion. Travis is awesome. Actually, you, 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 missed, you missed a sentence there. Sure, read it for me. Face. That's sweet, actually. I know I'll be an excellent wife. In fact, I really want that. I want to be married. I want to have a companion. Should I continue? Sure. Travis is awesome, no doubt, but there's just something that is off. I only know what the Spirit whispers to me, and that he's not the one. For marriage, right? That's what they're Apparently, talking about. Apparently, that's the implication. And then there's a sad face. I spent over a year of my life cultivating a relationship with him. I certainly wasn't thrilled. No, I was devastated when I discovered that he wasn't being faithful to me. And then she says... I just don't get why men cheat. She's talking about the fact that he cheated on her, right? Yes. So when we, this gives context to the previous paragraph of this exhibit, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Is that contiguous? I, I'm just, I don't have the paper in front of me. So sure. is that a part of the same writing? You see that oh, yes, 06 that. at the bottom? And then it has 698. This is the defendant's exhibit, so. Well, that's actually several pages away from. Well, the all I'm showing you is something that you see for identification and admission defendant. So that's, that's all I'm pointing out. Okay, that's fine. Okay. You also were asked about Exhibit 456. This is, you want to look at it, Plaintiff's Exhibit, so you can see the difference. That. And there's an entry there of January 24th of 2008. Yes. And it does say, I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report, right? Correct. And you've indicated that, well, you take issue with that. Do you know of anything that happened before that that's noteworthy in her life? Um, well, what was the date on that? January 24th, 2008. Um, not again. I, I, have to re I have to refresh myself. No, just as you're sitting here, anything noteworthy before January 24th of 2008? I, the witness is asking to refresh his recollection with regard to specific dates. May he do so? No, he's asking to look at his notes. I'm asking him not to. I'm asking him what he knows independently. Then I don't remember something. Right. I'm sorry. Sir, there's an objection. Please wait to respond. Objection overruled. You may answer the question. I don't recall specifically. I would like to have access to some paperwork so I could refresh my memory. There is a point, uh, or you did testify something involving some, uh, an incident where the defendant claimed that Mr. Alexander was masturbating to what? Pictures? Okay. I think that was the 22nd now. Okay, so it's the 22nd of 2008, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to object to this because he hasn't been allowed to refresh his recollection with regard to specific dates. These dates are not necessarily important to Dr. Samuel, so he would like to refresh I'm going to object to the speaking nature of this. Right. Approach, please, counsel. Sir, um, what time did she tell you that this incident took place? Well, sometimes in two, sometime in, I think, 2008, but I don't remember the exact date. Okay, I understand that you're saying now that you don't remember the exact date. I'm asking for time. What time did she tell you that she saw this incident? Time of the day. Well, the time of the day, I'd have to look at my notes. Go ahead and look at your notes. Okay. And then also look at your notes uh, for purposes of the uh, date, okay? Sure. Well, sir, don't you have your notes marked there? Yeah, I do, by date. Or you're looking oh. at something else that's not marked, oh. is my point. Uh, then I don't have a copy of my notes that were copied. So may I look at the, uh, the exhibit? Mr. Martinez, do you have any I notes? don't have those notes. I don't know where they went. Those are the ones that were the yellow cat. No. Sir, that's not them right in front of you? No, this is just... Fun. No, the other, the yellow notes. They're in front of it. Oh, oh you took for that particular day. I'm sorry. I thought you were looking for a whole collection of notes. Um, these notes don't involve the masturbation, if that's what you're referring to. Don't involve... They don't involve that particular episode? No. Uh, All right, if you have your notes somewhere else, go ahead and pull them out and we can have them marked as exhibits.
Okay, I'm looking. I'm still looking for it. Sure. Take your time. They're not indexed according to subject. Okay. Um, you can take the notes out so we can mark them, please. Okay. I'm not sure this gives me the date, but it, it's when she discussed well, it with me. Have them marked. Uh, exhibit number 542 then, and we can talk about this date. The date of the notes. The date of the notes. The date of the notes was May 4th, 2011, but that's not the first time she told me that story. Well, why don't we do this, sir? Okay. Let's go through that exhibit first. Sure. And see if that refreshes your recollection mm -hmm. as to a date. See if you mention any date there. Um, there's no date here to reference okay. that. Then you said that you have other notes. Go ahead and look and see if you can find the other notes to see if the other nodes have a date on right. it. I have another reference to it. All right, go ahead and we have we can have those marked so that we can keep it straight. Okay. You don't mind giving those back to me? Those to me and I'll give them back to you with the okay. exhibit tag. This is Exhibit 543, and you indicate that you have a reference here to that particular alleged incident. Yes. Why don't you review it and tell me whether or not there's a date on it? There is no date on it. So, of the incident. So, no date is indicated in either of your notes, correct? Correct. And you had told us before that um, you do not tape record, correct? Correct. So that all the information with regard to your speaking with her would be in the notes, right? Correct. I, um, Hold on, sir. Oh, one, one moment. You may continue. Okay. Um, it appears that you're looking somewhere else. I'm looking here. Yes, it's some other notes that I have. Um, I'm, this I'm was just, a, this occurred at the time. Let me, let me just do it this way. I know, I know. I just want to know if in anything like the yellow pad that you have there. Or I don't have the date. No. On anything like that, correct? Correct. Sir, one of the things that you told us uh, with regard to this case was that you believe that the defendant, um, and I'll read it, falls under the criteria of A1, A2, B3, C3, C, C6, and D3. And her scores on the post-traumatic disorder scale confirm the presence of PTSD and the elevated scales on the anxiety and PTSD scales of the MCMI3 support this as well, correct? Correct. That is your conclusion, right? Yes. And you said that you arrived at that conclusion using your DSM, correct? Correct. And that's that reddish book that you have yes. there? Yes. What's the date of publication on that book? 2000, I believe. 2000? I think so, yes. Sir, um, one of the things that you also testified to was that every 10 years, the academy or whoever it is or committee that mm -hmm. is involved in this uh, gets together and then they publish a new book, don't they? That's correct. Um, you have not purchased the new book that would be available in 2010, correct? It wasn't released then. It hasn't been released yet. It should be available within six months. Are you familiar with something known as DSM-4TR? Yes. 
that's something that was published subsequent to that, right? Yes, and I have an abbreviated copy here. I know you have an abbreviated copy, but that's something that has been published since that, and it addresses these same issues, correct? Right. And that, CR. And that's the most current book, if you will, on these issues, these diagnostic issues, right? They're virtually identical. I, I know you say they're virtually identical, but that's the newer version, correct? That's the newer version. And, um, but you did say that she falls on the criteria because when we talked, there was a lot of letters and numbers, but you said that she falls under the criteria of A1, correct? That's correct. A2, right? Yes. B3. Well, let me double check here. Here, let me mark it so that you can take a look at it. Okay. okay. This is a speaking report. objection, Judge. Please. Sir, you have your report there, right? I have my report. And All I right, also, so, so is that a yes? That I have my report, yes. And so it's B3, and after that it's what? That's correct. Uh, well, C3, right? In my report, there was an error. There was an I, I'm not asking you if there was an error. Am I? Am I not asking you to just tell me what's after B3? I will tell you what that is. Uh, in my report, I wrote C3. Okay, hold on. C3. C6. Hold on. Okay. D3. And D3, right? And D3. Right. But I had omitted. Yeah. Sir, you keep saying that you've amended this. Um, you amended that when? Uh, when I reviewed my report. No, 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 no. I need a date. A date? December of 2012. And that amendment was not provided to the state, was it? Uh, no, I didn't write an amendment. What I did was a. I'm sorry. Okay. Approach, please. Ladies and gentlemen, the last question was withdrawn. You may continue. With regard to Exhibit 525, I want you to take a look at the bottom of the number. It looks like it's page 17. And then it does say, see this where it says Jody Arias? Yes. And then if you take a look at Exhibit 544, that paragraph is the same between those two yes. documents, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And, sir, you did indicate that you are familiar with the guidelines that are set out in the DSM to reach a diagnosis of PTSD, right? That's correct. And I'm going to have mark this as an exhibit. And you don't have any reason to doubt what you just told us here. This A1. A2, B3, C3, C6, and D3 is what you wrote in your report, which is exhibit number 525. That's right. That's what wound up the period in my report. 
I'm going to go ahead and just have with Mark. Are you familiar with the diagnostic criteria for PTSD disorder and diagnosing it? Yes. Take a look at exhibit number 545 and see if that's not what the diagnostic criteria is. Those are the diagnostic criteria. And that's what you used in this case to diagnose the defendant with PTSD, correct? That's correct. I move for the admission of exhibit 545. And I want you to take a look at it, specifically the C section and the highlighted section. Yes. Read that slowly for me, please. Right. As I indicated earlier. No, 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 sir. I'm asking you to read. Persistent avoidance of. Oh, hold on. Slowly, please. Persistent, persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the trauma and numbing of general responsiveness not present before the trauma as indicated by three or more of the following. All right. It requires under C that you find three or more of the following, right? Yes. Under the section C, right? That's correct. You just told me that under section C you only found two, right? No, I omitted. No, sir. I found three. I omitted to type Judge, one of them in. I would move then in for admission of Exhibit 544. Objection, Your Honor. Here's the Here's the It's not a complete record. Council approach. You may continue. Take a look at Exhibit 544. This is it right here. That's a true and accurate written doc or reproduction of what's in your report, Exhibit 525, as to your findings in this case involving post-traumatic stress disorder. That's correct. It includes specifically the sections that you found, correct? Yes. Which are the ones that are up on, on the screen. And these are the ones that you submitted as part of your written report, correct? That is correct. All right. Move for the admission of the 544. I still object. Pardon? In objection. All right. Overruled. 544 is admitted. Sir, you have the document in front of you that talks about, or it's exhibit number 544, the C section, and it indicates that in order to find the C section of the post-traumatic stress disorder prong, there has to be three factors, doesn't it? Yes, I omitted typing those so, letters. Yes or no, sir? Order. Hold on. Yes or no? Your Honor, I'm going to object to that. He's allowed to finish his question. Yes. You may finish your response. I omitted typing uh, some additional numbers, which I discovered as I was reviewing my report for preparation for testimony. All and right. Are you done or go ahead? I wasn't done. Go ahead. So what I did was to re review uh, the criteria, and I printed up a list of the criteria and the ones that actually apply after referring back to some notes that I found when I was calculating and determining whether we met the, the criteria. And so there are several, in fact, uh, in, in B, there are actually no, three. No, sir, we're talking about C, sir. We're talking about C. In C, there are now four, and in D, there are three. I'm not asking you about DM. 
I'm asking you about C. Okay, C. So with regard to C, isn't it true that if it's just a, it's a counting kind of thing, uh, three are required to be found in order for there to be PTSD, correct? That's correct. You only listed two, right? That was in a typographical Is that mission. yes or no? Yes, it is. And sir, with regard to this, you're getting paid. How much are you getting paid per hour? I get paid per hour $250. And for $250 an hour, you, you're saying that this is not, you weren't paying enough attention to put whatever else was needed on your seat? I reviewed the report numerous times, and I must admit I missed it. All right, let's go over to D and read that section slowly as to what is required. Persistent symptoms of increased arousal, not present before the trauma, as indicated by two or more of the following. And so that one does call for two or more, correct? That's correct. In exhibit number 544, you only listed one, correct? Again, an omission of two of the I criteria. Under I understand that it's an omission. But if we just take a look at your report, which you said that you reviewed over and over again, right? I did. And you reviewed it for accuracy, right? Correct. If we just take a look at your report, just the report, and just what you have listed, that does not fit the diagnosis for PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Correct. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Right, we direct. Doctor, let's, ta let's start talking with what we just finished, okay? Okay, sure. So I want you to finish some of your answers here. You were talking about the um, C's and the D's and all of that. And I understand that you said that you uh, made typographical errors in your report. Is that right? Yes, I did. Okay. And so starting with the C's, can you tell us, do you have something to refer to what the, criteria, the different I do. criteria? I do. Okay. What, what are the criteria for in C that apply to Ms. Arias? And Judge, I think he's referring to something else and we can have that on the are you referring to something different? I'm referring to my worksheet on this, yes. Okay, can we have that marked then? Yes. Okay. that you prepared? Yes, this was something that I was preparing when I started to review this and I realized that I had omitted some letters and numbers. I went through the criteria again and I compared it to my notes, even included some of the new information that has been obtained and I've marked off those characteristics that meet criteria in C. Okay. Um, all right. And tell us what was the criteria that you found with regard to Ms. Arias that fits? For C. For C. Efforts to avoid thoughts, feelings, or conversations associated with the trauma. Okay, and how do you find that that fits with Ms. Arias' situation? Well, she created an alternative reality, and she remained in a state of deep denial, which we can also call derealization. Okay. And what number is that, C1? That's C1. Okay, C1. All right, and what's the next C3? C3, inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma. Okay, and how, I think we know, but Amnesia, how does that refer right. Oh, say that again? Five. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. That was C3? That was uh, C3. Okay, and C3, inability to recall. That's right. So is that what we've been talking about a lot? The That's right. The lapse in memory. That's correct. Okay. Then the next one? Uh, C5, okay. feeling of detachment or estrangement from others, and I indicated disconnection from one's sense of self, an old state of uh, consciousness, and... Uh, that feeling of detachment or estrangement uh, was something that she reported early on in the process. Less so today, but it was early on in the process. Okay. C6, restricted range of affect. In other words, unable to have loving feelings as an example, and I refer to the blunted affect that we've talked about previously. Okay. And seven, a sense of foreshortened future, 
This again was earlier on in the analysis when she was planning to kill herself, which is one of the reasons that she indicated that um, she wasn't willing to get in touch with her feelings and so forth. However, that's less of a, uh, of a function today. Okay. So did you say that was C7? That was C7. Okay. All right. And that and was so it for C. That was it for C? Yes. Okay. So I have C1, C3, C5, C6, and C7. Yes. So you find five criteria. That's correct. Okay. And what is the necessary criteria? Three. <laughs> All right. And had you noticed your error any sooner within your, in your typewritten report, would you have made corrections sooner? Oh, of course. And... Well, let's talk about let's talk about D next. Okay. Was there was there a mistake with regard to yes, D? Yes, I, I left out uh, again. Um, I found it required two out of uh, five. Okay. And I found two. All right. Which of those two? Irritability or outbursts of anger. And that's D what? That's D two. Okay. And I use as an example the anger that was expressed telephonically with her mother. Okay. Three difficulty concentrating. She was reporting difficulty concentrating to me at several times during our interviews, and that was C D two, D three uh, rather. D three, okay. Then D four, hypervigilance. She reported on a number of occasions that she had become very sensitive and, and reacted sharply to the noise that existed in the jail setting. Okay, and this is what we talked about yesterday with her inability to sleep, and she used to be able to sleep a lot. That's right. Okay. And with regard to sleep, I know there was some talk about nightmares. Her report to you about not sleeping was because of the noise around her. That's correct. She did not report nightmares on the PDS test. Okay. So how many D criteria do you You need two, and I found three. Okay. All right. And then with regard to A, A1 and A2. Yes. Both of those were met. And with A1. Num- do I repeat, read that? Yes, please. The person has experienced, witnessed, or been confronted with an event or events that involve actual or threatened death or serious injury, or a threat to the physical integrity of oneself or others. And I noted killing of Mr. Alexander. Okay. Um, and can that also be uh, Mr. Alexander attacking her first? Objection. Can that also be a trauma? Objection. Assumes facts, not in evidence. Uh, it could be, yes, it could be. Either is either, e- either one, but again, the, the, the killing was, in my opinion, so much more intense that that, I feel, superseded the, the attack. But yes, without the killing, the attack could have served as a criterion A1. Okay, and when you say intense, you mean traumatic to Miss Arias? That's correct. Okay, and what was in A2? Two, the person's response involved intense fear, helplessness, or horror. And then it says, note, in children it may be expressed instead by disorganized or agitated behavior. Okay. And based upon the crime scene's photograph, the threat to her life that the attack originally caused, and the killing itself, I selected, I I felt that she met criteria A2. Okay. Uh, and that was the intense fear. That's correct. All right. And did she speak with you in your numerous meetings with her? Did she speak to you about having intense fear? Numerous times. Did she speak to you about being terrified? Yes, she did. All right. And then we have B. We have B3. Uh, Is that correct? Yes. How many criteria? Actually, I found three criteria. Okay. You only need one. All right. And you listed one in your report of B3, but upon review of your notes in entirety? Apparently that was, yeah, yeah. Okay, so tell me, so let's, which ones did you One find? was recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections of the event. Those are the intrusive uh, thoughts. Including right, and, images, thoughts, or perceptions. Okay, and intrusive thoughts, we're talking not necessarily about the point which she can't remember, right? That's correct. She remembers the beginning of the attack and then the end of the attack. Okay. And so that... Those are the intrusive thoughts she reported, and they do fall into that category. Okay. The next was uh, B4, <laughs> intense psychological distress at exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an, access, an aspect of the traumatic event. Okay. And to that, I indicated an avoidance of reality and the creation of a replacement reality, i.e. the story, 
And uh, that was her ability, that was her reaction to the intense psychological stress brought about by whatever it was that she could remember of the incident. Okay. And And five, B5, physiologic reactivity upon exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. And I added the word shaking as an indication of a physiologic reaction uh, to internal or external cues that symbolize the, uh, the aspect of the event. I just want to be clear. When you say that you added the word shaking, you're not adding to the criteria. No, that's... no, that's what's my note. I use it as an example. I okay, want to make so, sure I had it here. Okay, so you're writing shaking mean is your example of what makes Miss Arias' situation fall within uh, B5. That's correct. Okay. Okay. And let's see, C we talked about, and D. So those are all the criteria. Is that correct? Yes. All right, and if the person has more criteria than others, does it... It's a baseline, isn't it? I mean, once they meet the criteria, they're diagnosed with PTSD? That's correct. It doesn't make it worse PTSD if they have more criteria. It might, but not in this case. Okay. Just more more characteristics. So it's not as though as you're trying to make Miss Arias' PTSD sound worse with more criteria? No. Okay. And... All right, let's... Let's stay on this for a second. You were asked about the book, the DSM-4? Yes. And it was published in what year? 2000? Uh, 2000. Okay. And they they go and publish every about 10 years. 10 years. Well, it's, this is overdue. The DSM-5 is overdue. All right. But it should be available soon. Okay. But it's not available to you right now? No, it's not available for sale. And was it available to you in 2010 when you first made your uh, report? No. Um, there may be some beta versions on the internet. There are actually, but that's not for official use yet, but just to introduce it. But we don't use it. it you don't use it until it's published? Until it's published. Okay. And there was some mention of uh, the DSM-TR. What is that? TR stands for text revision. Okay. Apparently when this original volume came out, um, there was some text that was deemed to be a bit confusing. So some sections were rewritten to make it easier, basically, for a layperson to read. And so uh, they came out with what's called DSM-4. It's the same, same uh, book, basically, but the text has been revised somewhat. It is essentially identical. So is it just the difference of how it's explained in the DSM? Yes, yes. I think there may have been one adjustment to uh, one or two codes in there, but they're not relevant to this case at all. So no adjustments to the PTSD? No. Uh, And being a psychologist for, is it over 30 years? Over 30 years. Over 30 years. Do you need to read a text revision that's made for lay people to understand? No. That's why I didn't uh, replace my book. So do you understand, you, you're, there, is there anything wrong with you using a DSM-4? No, not at all. In fact, I have a small version that I use for, for traveling. That's the TR version. And what I would do is that this is limited in terms of what it discusses. Um, but it does have the criteria in here, and they are virtually identical to the criteria in this book. Okay. You were asked about... Exhibit number 456, which we see, Exhibit 456, that this is was entered by P, the plaintiff, meaning the state. Is that right? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you were showed this portion. This portion, ah. nothing, no, nothing noteworthy to report. That was the day of her break, breakage of the finger, which well, was two days after the pedophilic incident. Okay. And so let's t- let's look at the. Judge, I didn't hear. Could, could he repeat that? That was two yeah. days after the pedophilia. He said the pedophilic-like behavior that we were talking about earlier when you asked me that question. Okay. So it's two days. Later. Yeah, a day or this two is after. not. A, Judge, can we have? Yes. I ask the questions. We have to repeat the response. We want it. next question. Thank you. Um, and let's look at Exhibit Five Eleven. This one is entered in by the defense, right? You see the yes. D. Okay. So this has the same first paragraph, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, but then does it also go on? Yes, it does. All right. And this is what you were uh, asked to read when she talks about uh, when she talks about uh, Travis having a problem. Is that right? Yes. And she goes on to talk about Travis uh, cheating on her. Yes. 
and she also talks in the very end of this exhibit about Travis when he, she's talking about um, Travis cheating on her that he seemed mildly remorseful do you see that up there yes I do but that was it that was it and then she says I'm going to stop writing about this right now it is of no benefit is that right? right? And she says, I could just rip out the last few pages, but I'll refrain from doing that. Correct. And obviously we have them, so they weren't torn out, That's right? That's right. Besides, uh, besides reviewing these journal entries, all of her journal entries, um, well, do you remember asking, you remember the uh, questions about Miss Arias' assertiveness? Yes. Okay. And I think, what were you trying to explain with regard to the journal entry that she's not going to stand for Travis saying negative things about her friends? Well, I'm, I'm glad that she was able to write that. I think that was 2007. Let's look. This is a Exhibit 510. And this was written Sunday... Yes. August 26th of 07. Mm -hmm. And she's talking about she's staying at Rachel's. Mm -hmm. And if Travis found out, he'd get upset, but I will not stand for him saying anything. Right. Great. And she also goes on to say that she won't stand for people, anyone else saying negative things about her. Uh, about Travis. That's correct. Okay. Now, the fact that she writes this in her journal, does, is that evidence of assertive behavior? Not at all. Why not? Because that's, her, she wrote something that was mildly assertive, but that does not translate into assertive behavior. There are people, I used, to, I used to run workshops a long time ago in assertive training, and I can tell you there's a big gap between what a person can write or say verbally about what they're going to do and then between them doing it. So there's a world of difference and the assertive training actually is number one designed to get them to at least envision themselves acting out in a more assertive manner and the main therapy involves training them to be able to act it out and do it. So there's a far, a far, a tremendous gap between writing something that's mildly assertive and acting it out and being an assertive person. Okay. And with regard to her acting it out and actually being assertive, specifically with Travis, do you remember her telling you about uh, her attempting to um, confront him back when he would yell at her? Yes. And do you remember her saying that he checked it real quick? He checked it real quick. He, he had total control. She was unable to break through that. Okay. And that did she tell you that she never tried it again? That's right. All right. Um, And in all of your time that you spent with Miss Arias, is there any time that she ever told you that she was able to stand up to Travis? No. You, taught, you were asked the question about uh, transient global amnesia. Do you remember Correct. that? All right. And that why would you bring up transient global amnesia when it has nothing to do with that case? Do you remember that line of I questioning? I do. With regard to that, what, is, what was the point of discussing transient global amnesia before we discussed disassociative amnesia? I wanted to show the jury, explain to the jury, that amnesia is not an unusual occurrence and that it can occur in cases of relatively trivial stress. And I wanted to point that out so they could see and followed with some research to show that this is a real phenomenon. Then I went into the more specific type of amnesia that was more related to this case. Okay. And when you talk about trivial stress, would that be the examples that was on that slide with the hot water and the cold water? Yes. And sex, intercourse? Yes. yes. Uh, now, you're not saying that that's what happened to Miss Arius, are you? Not at all. And that trivial stress, the point of that is that the, the trivial stress can 
In those 119 articles that was reviewed by the article that you read, yes, uh, discussed the trivial stresses that can cause amnesia. That's correct. Did that article, the review article of 119 different articles, did it discuss these trivial stresses causing amnesia? Yes. And that's a different kind of amnesia, is that right? That's correct. Is that a different kind of amnesia? That is a different kind of amnesia. All right. Um, with regard to the trivial stresses, what is the, what is the point of the trivial stress? What does it do to our body that can trigger amnesia? It could be some shock to the system. Um, it, it is not necessarily of the same magnitude as what will cause a dissociative amnesia, which will throw the body into a state of acute stress and, and create far more difficulties for the client. We don't know the physiology, but these cases are reported. They are real cases. And it's not just reported once, but there are 119 articles that were summarized. So this is a fairly commonly occurring uh, situation, occurring maybe three or eight times per 100,000 population per year. Now, if we're not talking trivial stress, and instead if we're talking about a woman who was attacked by someone she loved, and her having to defend herself and ultimately killing him, is that something more than trivial? I have an objection goes to what we previously discussed. Approach. Doctor, let me ask that in a different way, okay? Sure. If, when we're comparing, we were talking about trivial stresses, right? Yes. In comparing that to a a woman who is attacked by someone she loves to the point that she has to protect herself. Same and it, I don't know how else I can word it. Approach. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 315. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please approach. Briefly, for just one more moment.